Hey crew, how's it going? So if you haven't gotten the breaking news alert, this channel recently crossed 20,000 subscribers. And I'm just so blown away by that number and I wanted to do something to commemorate that and what better way than a good old fashioned Q&A video. This channel has been around for about a year and I realized that I've never really done anything like this and no time like the present, so let's do it. So first up, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Griffin, thank you for asking. So I got quite a few questions asking me how I got started making videos. And I'm trying to think of the most concise way to explain this because it was kind of a long time coming, but really it all started in the winter of 2020 going into 2021. I, like I think most of us, had a lot of free time on my hands. And for me, it was a pretty low moment. I was really hating the job that I had at the time. Uh, I was feeling very stifled and cooped up and stuck. And at the same time, I was exploring a lot of um, old passions that I had. And one of those passions was ocean liners. I had been interested in ocean liners ever since I was a kid, you know, really ever since I saw the movie Titanic. I think they're fascinating. I think they're beautiful. Uh, I think they are such a fascinating window into world history. And I find myself wanting to know everything about them. And so I was spending a lot of time on YouTube watching these really, really amazing videos on ocean liners. And I started thinking, you know, I went to film school, I know how to edit, and I love these ships, and I want so badly to be creating something, and this is something that I don't need anyone else's permission to create. I can create this on my own. And so on New Year's Eve, I set a resolution that I was gonna make a YouTube channel and I was gonna start creating videos. And if no one watched them, who cares? Because I like doing it and I needed something like that. And so New Year's Day 2021, I sat down and started working on my Queen Elizabeth video. And I told myself that, you know, if this gets 100 views, then that'll be great. And I published it and was really encouraged by the reaction it got. There was not a lot of people, but there was a small number of people who I didn't know, who weren't my mom or my friends, who were commenting on it saying, this is really cool and I love it. So I made a few more videos. And then the first video that really took off was my Bremen video. Uh, I made that video very quickly because I was leaving for a camping trip and I threw it together. But I also had a lot of fun making that video and I was away from internet for a couple days. And when I got back on um, the grid, so to speak, I checked that video and it just, exploded and was doing numbers totally unlike anything I'd created before. And that lifted the whole channel and I got a lot of subscribers. And really from there, that was when I started just steadily producing successful videos. And it's been so gratifying and such a amazing way to explore the history that I love and create things that I love and start building out a really awesome community on this platform. And I am just so grateful for that every day. Next up, how long does it take you to make your videos? So it takes about a month each video. There's a pretty extensive amount of time that I spend researching the topic. And there's also a lot of time that I spend looking for video clips that I can use in the video. Uh, I find clips all over the place. Some of them I license, some of them I find in obscure video archives online. I would say that takes the vast amount of time making all these videos. The next thing that takes the most amount of time is recording voiceover. I hate my voice. I hate recording voiceover, but it is a necessary evil because I'm not going to pay someone to do it. And then I think the easiest and most enjoyable part is the actual editing, and that only takes a few days. What is your day job? So I'm a content writer and an editorial producer at a brand. No, I will not tell you what brand, uh, Google it, except don't. Or um, if you do, don't uh, be weird about it. All right, uh, enough about me, because I already feel super weird. And now 
now, time to talk about what this channel is actually about. First up in this category, if you were given the option to save one ship whose career was cut short, which one would it be and why? So there are so many to choose from. Uh, I think the most obvious is the Titanic, followed by the Britannic, and I would throw in there the Normandy. I think for me, a huge question is what would the industry have looked like if the Normandy survived World War II? Because she so famously didn't make a profit during the Great Depression, but she was only in service for four seasons and never, and never really had the opportunity to shine the way the Queen Mary did. If the Queen Mary was sunk during World War II, would she have such an iconic status today? Who knows? But I would love to see what the Normandy would have done after the war. And if she would have gone on to really uh, claim her place in history, and would the French have ever allowed her to be scrapped? I don't think so, but I would love to know. If you could sail on any liner and completely immerse yourself in the era, which ship would it be? So this is a tough one because, you know, a lot of my favorite ocean liners, I think, would be pretty uncomfortable to sail on by today's standards. And I know I'm not supposed to say that, but um, I think some of these Edwardian liners were beautiful and grand and amazing, but I think if you actually had to live on them day to day, when you're used to the standards of today, it would be a little bit rough. But I think for me, I would, <laughs> I hate that my answer for every question is the Normandy, but I would love to experience what it would have been like to be on the Normandy. I think that that is just the height of luxurious ocean travel in the purest form of what it could have been. And to experience one of her first class cabins, they were all unique. Not a single one was the same. And experience the service and the free table wine and just the beauty of that ship. I would love to know what that was like. Do you find yourself feeling nostalgic for this time period despite things like wars and other problems of ocean travel? This is kind of a weird phenomenon that I experience sometimes where I feel nostalgic for a past that I never had, but I do often find myself feeling nostalgic for the time of ocean liners and at least the image in my head of what it was like to travel and be on these on these ships. Something that I uh, am so uh, bothered by now is how quickly everything seems to go. Everything moves so fast and we're so bombarded with information and I find myself so often feeling like my life is in fast forward because of this. And that's whole, that makes it so appealing to imagine a time where you would get on a ship and for six, seven days, all you really had to do was just live and eat and read a book and sit on deck and talk to people and you didn't have a phone, you didn't have the internet, you didn't have anything. You were just on this, you know, machine in the middle of the ocean. I really, really long for that kind of simplicity and that kind of uh, disconnection from the world. So next up, I got a few questions kind of like this that are basically asking uh, if I foresaw any kind of reemergence of ocean liners as a form of travel or really any capacity. And I, like I said in one previous video, I, you know, this is a history channel. I don't tell the future, I tell the history. And really, unfortunately, I think no. Um, I think using ocean liners as a form of transportation is really a thing of the past. And I think the only way that it would come back is if there was some kind of massive disruption to the airline industry. And I really don't see that happening. If anything, I see the airline industry innovating to be more efficient, and I just don't see ocean travel taking a place of it. And the main reason is because the most valuable resource that any of us have is our time. And that just becomes more and more and more apparent as every year goes by. 
And I just don't see a world in which people would voluntarily give up six days uh, to travel between Europe and the United States. And speaking from an American perspective, which is the only perspective that I can speak from, taking vacation is pretty hard in America. And taking a long vacation is almost impossible. You know, you can take a week off and go to Europe, but if you had to take a ship there, it would be six, five, six days on the ship, however many days you want to spend in Europe, and then another five or six days on the ship. And <laughs> most Americans can't get that kind of time off, unfortunately. So the only way I could really see it happening is if the airline industry was totally <laughs> knocked out of the sky somehow and ocean liners became a lot quicker but really i think the you know despite that long rambling answer ocean liners really have come back and that is in the cruise industry and i know that a lot of people following this channel would be pretty mad at me for saying that but um you know there's a multi-billion dollar industry in which Millions of people choose to be on ships for extended periods of time. And that is not really ocean liners, but it is a form of ocean travel. And I don't know. I think that's a thing. <laughs> next question. <laughs> and this segues pretty well into the next question, which is what do you think of the Queen Mary 2? Does it maintain the tradition of the great ocean liners? So, yes and no. So, caveat, I've never been on the QM2, so I don't really know what it is like to be on board. But from everything that I've read and seen, uh, the Cunard line takes a ton of pride in their history, and I think they do, they put a lot of effort into recreating what those transatlantic voyages would have been like on the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth and the other great Cunarders. So, in a way, it does. Um, in another way, you know, <laughs> the Queen Mary 2 is really, uh, you know, a cruise ship that is a cruise ship and an ocean liner kind of smashed into each other. I think she's pretty beautiful. I think she's much more beautiful than most of the cruise ships that are sailing today. And I don't know. I really like her and I, I sincerely hope that uh, when it becomes time to retire her that the Carnival Corporation and all their infinite wisdom decides to pony up and create another ocean liner because I do think it's pretty awesome that you can still book passage on an ocean liner between uh, the United States and Europe. I hope that's something that doesn't ever go away. If the RMS Olympic had struck an iceberg after its refit in 1913, would it have survived? Frankly, I don't think I'm very qualified to answer this question. I think the damage to the Titanic was pretty severe and would have sunk most ships then and even a lot of ships now but you know at the same time the olympic was a badass she ran down a u-boat she you know chopped through a light ship i would not bet against the olympic which topic was most fun to research and make so two answers here i think the video that was most fun to make was my normandy video no comment on what happened to that video and the most fun to research was the Valencia. I think the Valencia was a video that I intended to be a very short little spooky Halloween video and then I started reading about the disaster and reading accounts of what happened that night and I found myself completely fascinated and ended up making a much longer video than I intended. But uh, everything about that disaster is just so frustrating and interesting. It's wild to me that, that that happened. But at the same time, I think everyone involved in that disaster made a very uh, human decision. And uh, sometimes that doesn't work out very well for people. It's just a fascinating story. Do you think Titanic 2, if it ever sails, is really a tribute to the tragedy or just a publicity stunt? I would be pretty surprised if a Titanic 2 project ever actually sails and ever actually has paying customers. That said, 
if it actually does happen, I don't think it is a very tasteful way to honor the victims of that tragedy. The most overhyped ocean liners. So <laughs> it's kind of funny because ocean liners in general are just a very niche interest. So the idea of anything in the ocean liner community getting too much hype is kind of funny to me. But I think the obvious answer to this is the Titanic. And I say this as a huge Titanic fan, someone who is deeply fascinated with the Titanic and, uh, you know, the Titanic tragedy, I think like most of us, is the reason I'm interested in ocean liners in the first place. I think the reason this community exists is because of, of the Titanic disaster. But you know, I think outside of the ocean liner community, the Titanic has taken on a mythical status in the zeitgeist. And it's something that I'm not totally sure how I feel about. But, you know, on one hand, I love that people know about this ocean liner and I love that people know about history. But so I don't think I've heard a thing about the Titanic from someone who isn't a historian or enthusiast that's been correct in the last several years. I hear it called a cruise ship and I hear all kinds of stuff about how Oh, it was terribly built and it had terrible steel and was, you know, the captain was a moron and all these things that are just flatly not true. And, you know, I'm sort of giving away a video that I'm planning on doing in the future right here, but the Titanic that people know is not actually the Titanic. What they know is a story. And that's why, you know, it's a stand in for so many people for greed and hubris and uh, the class system and terribly built ships and whatever. Even though it was a really, really great ocean liner that got really, really unlucky. But you know, the real Titanic, no one actually cares about that. They just care about their story. And that's uh, really weird. I don't really know if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It's just weird for someone like me, who's an enthusiast who uh, spends a lot of time researching and learning about these topics. It's very strange seeing how um, the wider cultural zeitgeist adopts these things and uses them for other purposes. If you had to live on any liner for the rest of your life, taking into account accommodations, route, and time period, which would it be? Oh god. This sounds a little bit like that episode of Spongebob where Squidward goes to live in the town where everything is perfect and he ends up hating it because it's too perfect. That would be me living the rest of my life on an ocean liner. I, <laughs> I think one of the things I love so much about ocean liners is that it's a break, but if the break becomes your entire life, ugh, that would be pretty rough. But that's not the spirit of this question. Uh, I think, you know, let's go with the Normandy. Normandy would be cool. Or, no, let's mix it up. Let's say SS France. SS France was awesome. If you had unlimited money, but had to turn a profit, what would you do to the SS United States or another ocean liner in a similar state? You know, I don't think there's any like great secret to this. I think faithfully restoring these ships to their original condition and then turning them into a well-run and well-maintained hotel and museum is really the answer here. Looking at the, the Rotterdam and Queen Elizabeth II, both of these seem to offer really great destinations for people. I think the problem with the Queen Mary is that she was horrifically mismanaged for decades. I think if the Queen Mary was faithfully restored and was lovingly and properly maintained over the years, she would be in great condition right now. And I think she would potentially even be profitable. But, you know, she was neglected for so long and basically turned into a tourist trap. And that's basically how we got to the condition it is now. So for the SS United States, you know, it's really rough because the SS United States is just a shell. So restoring her interiors would be an enormous undertaking and i really hope that it happens but it is it's tough but you know fingers crossed i live in new york and a lot of the plans involve moving her to new york and i would be very thrilled if they moved her to my city 
And now to round things out, I'm going to do a few rapid fire quick answers to jazz this whole thing up. Did you play Titanic Adventure out of time in the 90s and early 2000s? Absolutely I did, and the music still haunts my dreams. How to become like you? A lot of childhood trauma. The proposed SS Normandy running mate, the more traditional two-funnel design, or the more radical avant-garde proposal? Definitely the radical avant-garde proposal, because that would have been something. If Mauritania and Olympic had been retained in reserve for a few more years, were they in reasonable enough condition to have been effectively used as troop ships during World War II? I think definitely. I don't think they were in any worse shape than the Aquitania was when she was used, so if they somehow survived through the 30s, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't have been used as troop ships. They probably would have been uh, a pretty big asset to the Allies, to be honest. Do you prefer the modern Art Deco style of ocean liners like Normandy and Queen Mary, or the old English oak style of Titanic and Lusitania? This is a tough one, because I love both of them for different reasons. I think if I had to choose, I would probably go for the style of the Lusitania. I just think that she is so light and airy and beautiful and comfortable looking. I love that. Do you prefer MV Britannic or MV Georgic? I mean, the Georgic was pretty cool. What is your favorite cruise ship or non-ocean liner? Ooh, SS Norway. Can you recommend some books about the Titanic and or other ships? So Titanic on a Sea of Glass is an incredible overview of the disaster and everything leading up to it. And for other ships, I think The Only Way to Cross by John Maxstone Graham, that is basically my Bible, and it is an incredible book that I would highly recommend if you're interested in ocean liners. What is your favorite ocean liner? I've answered this a few times, and it might change, but right now it's the Normandy. What is your favorite lake freighter? I don't know. What's your favorite lake freighter? Out of all the four funnel ships, which is your favorite? Mm, so this is such a tie between the Olympic and the Aquitania. Uh, the Aquitania, I have some family history with the Aquitania that I talked about in another one of my videos. And then the Olympic is just, you know, the Olympic. I, I love the Olympic. The Olympic is the best. So, um, one of those. <laughs> And last, but certainly not least, because this video probably should not be several hours long, uh, what is the ugliest ocean liner? And so I am going to pick a fight with my old rival, the SS Pastille. I hate how this ship looks. It looks so weird. It looks like they didn't finish it. And I know a lot of people like it. And every time I talk about hating it, people are always, people always come to its defense. That I don't like it. it. Looks weird. And on that loving, hateful note, uh, that's where I'm gonna leave you all. I just want to say again a huge thank you to everyone who follows this channel, everyone who watches my videos and likes them and comments on them. It means so much to me and it helps me keep creating them. I absolutely love doing this and I want to be doing it more. And I have really ambitious plans to grow the channel a lot this year. And so I really hope that all of you are ready to take the ride. If you like this video, go ahead and hit the thumbs up, comment below, tell me how dumb I am or tell me how right I am and how cool I am, whichever floats your boat. And I'm also going to include our new website down below where I will have a donation link. I don't have a Patreon yet because I'm still trying to figure out how I want to do that because I don't really want to do a Patreon unless I have something to offer you guys. So still trying to think of what that'll look like. But in the meantime, I have my website down below where you can donate if you want to, but only if you want to. Please don't feel like you have to give me money. Just watching my videos is plenty and you all already support me so much and it means a lot and i'm really excited to see where this channel goes so that is it stay safe and be nice to people be mean to the ss pastilla